Yeah, so as, as Fiona said, I, I guess I'm here to talk because uh, we recently, we were successful with that rapid call for mental health funding in the North. Um, I must say, I do feel marginally uh, fraudulent doing this talk because I feel like my grant funding history is, is far from anything to shout about. But um, I guess my kind of goal for this talk is I'm going to say a little bit about my own experience of applying for grants and hopefully offer some reassurance about how a painful that process can be at times. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the one we got funded and I'm going to try and uh, I guess present some suggestions or advice tentatively from my own experiences. Um, so that's going to be the goal at least. Uh, next slide please. There we go, so this is me. Uh, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a senior clinical lecturer at University of Manchester. Um, before that, I was over at University of Liverpool for a little while. Uh, my main sort of area of research is around self-harm and suicide. And, and the successful funding we had is actually for a feasibility trial, which is about um, a brief talking therapy for university students struggling with suicidal thoughts. Um, and, and in terms of expertise, I'm largely quantitative, but I do sort of dabble in qualitative approaches as well. Um, I think that's enough for me. If, if we go on to the, the next slide, perhaps. Brilliant. So, so I, I thought I'd start by saying a little bit about my sort of grant, my, my grant success or lack of uh, journey. Um, so I guess there's probably quite a few people here. You know, I've, I've been sort of, you know, f f since I guess since getting into academia, that's sort of part of it, isn't it? That kind of process of applying for things and so on. So I've, I've had a kind of varied history of applying for funders. I think the first big grant I went for was with the ESRC, and that was m more kind of theory building. It was looking at help seeking amongst people who uh, self-harm um, and sort of the factors that contribute to help seeking. I think we did quite well with that. We got right through to sort of the final step of the ESRC process. Uh, but we were unsuccessful right at the end. Uh, we had one reviewer that just wasn't keen at all with us, unfortunately, which I think did it in. Um, and we, it, this is one of the things I'll come back to later, but I think, I guess, a learning point even from there was that with ESRC at that time, I don't know if it's changed, you couldn't resubmit the same application. So uh, certainly one of the learning points I've come to was that we put a lot of work into the application, but we couldn't really resubmit it back to them after we'd been rejected that time. Um, follow, we did try it a few other places, and since then I've tried sort of various other funders and applications, and I mentioned a few there, so MRC, Wellcome Trust. Uh, American Foundation for Suicide Research is a more sort of, um, I guess, suicide-specific funder, and obviously the NIHR. Um, and I've had various near misses and ones that have come quite close, but I have had a lot of rejection, um, and I guess I wanted to say that because I suspect others here in the audience have had a similar experience. I must admit, I, I, I should have done some research on this. I did wonder what the sort of typical success to rejection rate is for sort of researchers for bids, or kind of how that averages out. I don't know what that looks like. I remember talking to a colleague who sort of said he gets like one in 20, but I don't know if that's representative or not. I counted, I've had about eight where I've been PI that have been rejected um, over the years. Um, but I have had a bit of success as well. Um, Particularly this this NIHR one we've just got through of the rapid call, which obviously was funded or, or um, recommended for funding at least, uh, as Fiona said, uh, which is brilliant. Um, and also a few where I've a few kind of really small things where I've been PI on, and a few where I've been a co-investigator as well, where we've been sort of lucky with funding around those. And those are um, MRC and just sort of GCRF funding in particular, for sort of international research. Um, so that's a little bit about my sort of journey of funding. If we go on to the next slide, perhaps. Um, so just before I push on, I guess some learning points so far that I've sort of picked out. Um, I guess these are reflections that I guess in terms of kind of things I've done and not necessarily doing things in the best way either. I suppose one of those is just about hanging on to good ideas. I think, um, you know, I think developing a really good concept for a for a efforts for a grant application and all the kind of background research that goes into that and, and they are huge amounts of work regardless of the scheme you're going for so i think where you have a really good idea and you've kind of done the background research there is something about hanging on to that and trying it at different places i think um 
One of the things I've, I've sort of done that maybe has been sort of less strategic is a tendency to kind of flip between different ideas and sort of new ideas. I get excited by new projects and then we have a go of that and then another one. Um, but I think actually in terms of kind of efficiency and, you know, I think if you've got a really good idea for, a, you know, an application and you feel like there's something in it, you know, hang on to it and, and try and shape it up with kind of, you know, the rejections or the feedback you get, but hang, hang on to the idea and take it forward rather than, jumping to something new. That's kind of a more advice to myself, I guess, perhaps than anyone else. Um, and, you know, consider kind of recycling what, what you've done. Again, I, I think one of the challenges with applying for funding is just the amount of work that needs to go into a good application. So I think, you know, where, where possible, you know, recycle that work, you know, things like sort of PPI, you know, get having kind of advisory groups, having those meetings, make the most of that, um, I guess, sort of data you're getting essentially so that you want to kind of, again, it's around kind of re hanging on to those projects and trying them elsewhere. Um, I think part of this is a little bit about thinking where you're sending them. As I said, in the past, I've, um, I suppose, had issues with, with funders where you can only submit once. And I do think there's always a bit of a risk there because, uh, you know, there's a lot of this various funding sort of bodies out there, but I think it's always a bit of a challenge if you kind of have one shot at something. I mean, one thing quite like about NIHR is at least you can resubmit stuff. So there is this opportunity to then reshape what you're doing, take the feedback on board and try again. Um, and I think now more recently, I'm focusing more on NIHR grants for various reasons, but part of that is because I think the ability to resubmit me sort of saves a lot of kind of pain, I think, compared to the kind of one shot funders that are out there. Um, but yeah, so kind of build build on your, your kind of work and hang on to those ideas. Um, having a really good team, I think, is massive. And I mean this in a few different ways. Um, and I know Christine before commented on this and having um, a really good kind of sort of team and varied skills and so on is really important to a good application. But I think also in terms of people you work well with and people who you know will sort of pitch in with the application is important. Um, so I've been, I think I've kind of had both and I've had applications I've worked on where, you know, maybe there's a team of people, but I'm kind of just as PI doing all the work and pushing that along. Um, and then, you know, and I've also had situations where actually I've been able to kind of as PI delegate and had really good colleagues who've sort of taken sections forward. And I think if, if you can find people to work with that you know will be able to kind of pitch in and take parts of it forward, I think that just really helps in sort of making the workload more manageable. So I think when you're thinking about the team you want to work with, there is something about thinking, you know, obviously what looks good on, what, what looks good on the application and, you know, kind of people's strengths and so on, but also just in terms of who you'll work well with and who is likely to make the application process uh, as painless as possible. Um, I think, you know, trying to just go it alone um, and sort of push on by yourself is just really difficult because they are, they are big pieces of work, as I said. Um, and don't give up, I guess. I, th I think um, I asked when Fiona asked uh, sort of if wanting to do it, I did ask her how cynical I could be during the talk. And I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to be sort of optimistic with a, with a touch of cynicism. But I think there is an element of sort of look to it. I, I don't know if that kind of spells sort of plays out or not from the sort of panel perspective. But certainly as someone who's applied for a few grants, it feels like there is an element of kind of what sort of, what feels like it appeals to the mind of a particular reviewer or a particular sort of panel. Um, and so I think there is an element of just not giving up and trying again, hanging on to ideas, but, I, but also I think just recognizing that it can be a, a stressful process and to have a break between applications um, because, you know, you know, you don't want to kind of burn yourself out trying to put these things again and again. Um, again, that's, that's like advice to me as well as anyone else, I think. Um, I'll, I'll move on anyway. Um, I need to keep an eye on time as well. Uh, so I'm going to say a little bit about the study we got funded. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to say a tiny bit at the end, just about, I suppose, what I think helped in terms of getting that funded uh, and some of the aspects of the project that I think sort of got us to that point, I suppose. Uh, as I said, it's, it's the MIST trial or MIST uh, is, is the project that we've had funding for. And this is mental imagery for suicidality in students trial. Um, so if you could go on to the next slide, please. So just quickly about the context, um, you know, we know suicide is a massive global health problem. It's um, 
a big cause of mortality, but one that also sort of disproportionately affects the younger ages compared to, I guess, other sort of other kind of causes of mortality. And we have seen some evidence of rises amongst young people, both in terms of suicide, but I think also in terms of self-harm more broadly, um, some types of self-harm more than others, but there do seem to be kind of suggestions of increasing rates in places. Um, it, alongside this as well, I think there's also been a growing concern really about mental health among student populations. Uh, and we know that stu the suicidal thinking, for example, is really prevalent among students at the moment. Um, I think, you know, statistics vary, but there's um, one sample I was looking at, there's something like 45, 42%, I think it was, of students have contemplated suicide in the last year. So, you know, so kind of some very high, so very concerning data around that. Um, I think obviously with COVID that's added to the stress a lot of students are under. And I think any if anyone in the audience has been in a sort of advising role at a university, I think you've probably come across students in quite a lot of distress. Um, we know suicidalism, suicidal ideation is an important issue for a lot of reasons. It's, it's a risk factor for actual suicidal behavior. But I think it's also a kind of indicator of distress and someone who's really struggling as well. And we should be treating it as a as a kind of sign of a clinical need, I think. Um, yeah, university can be really stressful. Um, it's, you know, I think it's also a time in young people's lives uh, where a lot of stuff is going on and that can also add to the stress and difficulty people face. Um, I, I think as well, though, there's an opportunity with kind of universities in terms of you have this sort of infrastructure there to provide support and provide intervention. Uh, and I, but, Unfortunately, despite this, I think historically and maybe even now, mental health provision has always been quite patchy at universities. I think that is improving. And one of the kind of backgrounds to this particular project is certainly in Manchester, we've had the development of this sort of student mental health hub that links a lot of different universities. And so there's this kind of growing awareness of student mental health and this sort of building of infrastructure to help support students. So I think within that, there's opportunities to think about how we best help those students who might be struggling with suicidal feelings in particular. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, there we go. So, th so the intervention itself is something called the Broad Minded Effective Coping Technique or BMAC, which is an awful acronym and we need a better acronym for it or a different name, <laughs> but there you go. Um, it's actually been knocking around for a while. It was developed at Manchester, um, some work by Nick Tarrier a while back. So, and it's sort of been developed within the context of suicide prevention. So it's initially it was kind of a, a sort of developed as a kind of one off uh, sort of imagery type technique. It, it focuses on helping people to sort of connect to positive memories and experiences and sort of develop their ability to access and, and kind of immerse themselves i suppose within those kind of positive experiences um it's been used a little as a kind of add-on to different interventions but um, more recently uh, what we've done is looked at it as kind of more of a standalone technique or approach for helping people struggling with suicidal thoughts um, i'll come to this later as well but i think one of the things that's really helped with this application has been that there's already been a bit of work around the BMAC. So um, we know, for example, there's been a few studies now just looking at kind of immediate impacts on, for example, people with psychosis, people with PTSD. Uh, there's also a study I did a while back looking at it in students and just showing that, you know, administering kind of one-off exposure to this sort of intervention leads to some improvements in mood, well-being, and so on. Um, so there's already a bit of a history of work around it uh, and, and, and you know, this kind of context of using it within suicide prevention but um but i think no one's quite yet explored it as developed it into more of a standalone therapy for young people um yeah so if we go on to the next slide um so the first thing we did this was actually a trainee clinical psychologist project and we basically we developed up the bmac into a kind of six session uh, therapy essentially so this was delivered by a trainee clinical psychologist so this um so this is I think it says in prep, but I think we've submitted it now to a journal. So touch wood, we get that published. Um, but this was uh, like a small case series. So she ended up seeing 10 people in overall. It was all students recruited through the university counselling service who had uh, suicidal ideation or experiences of suicide attempts in the past uh, four weeks, was it? Yeah, I think so. Um, so, yeah, and, and the idea was to just... Um, 
mostly focused on feasibility. So looking at kind of recruitment rates, attendance, and how the young people found the intervention. So acceptability type data. Uh, I've got a little flow chart here because everyone loves the flow chart. And yeah, you can see that, you know, so, so we kind of have pretty good recruitment rates. Um, you know, a few people didn't want to get involved, but of the kind of 12 that were referred, we actually ended up with 10 of them finishing the study, a really good completion of assessments, a really good engagement with the intervention. Um, if we go on to the next slide, please. There we go. And there was some nice uh, feasibility type evidence from it, despite the small sample. So yeah, attendance of sessions was good. Uh, people felt the intervention was helpful on the whole. You know, it was, a, it was applicable. It was a good match for them. Um, you know, so there's some good evidence that it seemed to fit the needs of that group. Uh, and we had some really basic sort of pre-post sort of changes and outcomes. But there was some evidence from that that you, we saw a decline in suicidal thinking and, and the sort of stuff that you really want to see uh, to suggest the intervention uh, might have clinical promise. Um, I, it's, it's a slight tangent, but I think that one thing I always find tricky in feasibility applications is trying to sort of balance this tightrope between, well, you can't say there's efficacy, but you sort of need to suggest there's clinical promise and how you kind of balance that, I think is always a bit challenging. But I think this kind of data is important in sort of suggesting, well, there's some indication here that it could be helpful and it's worth following up on. Um, yeah, if we go to the next slide, Brilliant. So I'll go on to the the MIST project then. Um, so that so I think having done that case series, I, I mean, again, I'll mention this again later, but I think that's one of the things that really helped is we had the kind of more sort of broader history of data around the BMAC. Uh, we had this kind of recent sort of pilot essentially that showed, had some really nice data about feasibility and acceptability. So I think we had a really good platform for then putting in this application. Uh, so the project itself is a feasibility randomized control trial. So the focus is very much on looking at, well, can we evaluate this therapy within the context of an RCT? So there's still a lot of kind of feasibility uncertainties around about, you know, uh, attention, uh, sorry, um, you know, attendance and, and kind of missing data and all those sorts of issues as well. So we've got a very kind of clear feasibility focus. And as part of the application, we had very specific kind of stop go criteria for whether it would then lead on to a larger efficacy focused um, trial or not. Um, and also kind of sort of mixed methods. So we built in a lot of kind of qualitative interviewing, both with uh, the young people themselves, but also with kind of stakeholders. So uh you know university counselors and you know the therapists and so on just to try and explore issues around implementation and the sort of feasibility in that sense as well um yeah so if we go on to the next slide um there we go so just uh, this is kind of the plan for the study then so we're aiming to recruit 66 young people They're, they should be students uh at kind of universities in the north um with kind of recent suicidal thoughts or behavior. Um, there's two, R, it's a sort of straightforward RCT in that we have two arms to the intervention with a number of follow-ups. One thing we are adding in is in addition to, so there's a group that gets the BMAC and a group that doesn't, but all of the groups will get um, some level of intervention. So we're providing a sort of a, a kind of one or two session enhanced uh, risk assessment and, and signposting session. I guess given the population and given the risks of working with students struggling with this stuff, we felt that having some level of kind of risk, I guess, enhanced risk management was important, which is why that's there. Um, brilliant. So I'll go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, so I, I can say more about the trial, but I'm aware of time, so I'll push on. I mean, this is just the investigator team. Um, so lots of uh, brilliant people there. I think one of the key things which really helped to the application was having a very, I guess, a team with a lot of experience. There's people here with loads of kind of trials experience who have kind of been really successful with sort of funding, you know, large funded projects and clinical trials, particularly around psychological interventions. So I think that helps. But also, I think a real mix of skills. So if we've got people leading on qualitative stuff. We have a, a statistician. Uh, we have Nathan, who uh, is is kind of involved as someone with lived experience of kind of young people's services and, and kind of mental health difficulties and is leading on uh, the PPI stuff. Um, you know, so we have a kind of range of skills. And, and I think one of the key things was that everyone kind of had a specific kind of area or focus within the trial team, uh, which I think 
Christine touched on before, but I think that's important as well. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll move on from that. Um, there we go. Here's, here's our kind of quick timeline as well. So initially we started putting this together as a sort of generic RFPB research led um, sort of application. And that was around October last year. Um, so we started developing that. We got some RDS input as well, which was really helpful. Um, really useful to get that. Um, and then the uh, we, we learned about this, this kind of rapid call, the mental health in the north call. So it was quite good in a way, because we'd already kind of put in this groundwork and started to work up an application when we heard of that. So we were able to kind of rapidly reconfigure what we'd done for the rapid call. We thought we'd have more opportunity with that. Um, and it seemed to fit of the remit being sort of mental health focused and very much based in the north as well. Um, so we put that in um, in June, I think it was. Uh, yeah, and then we, we we found out a couple of months ago and now we're sort of, you know, hurriedly trying to get things moving uh, for the trial itself. But that's kind of the, the timeline. I think one thing that did help was already having um, the sort of having already started before that came up. I think those rapid calls can be good in the I guess well, there's less competition for one and because they're more targeted, it means I think you've got more chance of getting funded than the kind of general researcher led call. But certainly with that one, a real challenge was just the time frame and not having long at all to put the application in uh, was a real challenge. I think if we hadn't already started to develop ideas anyway, I don't know whether we would have then been able to kind of mobilize and put something together quite so quickly. Um, so I think that was really useful to already kind of have that ready. Um, if we've gone to the next slide, um, so I think I think my time's kind of up. I'll just wrap up with some sort of quick things that helped for that application, which I think I've already touched on a little bit. As I said, I think kind of the call itself helped a lot. You know, it was specifically about mental health. Uh, and as I said, being kind of the rapid call, I think there was probably less competition than the wider researcher-led RFPB calls. Um, I think the inter intervention was kind of at the right place, if that makes sense. So in terms of the kind of, you know, there's like the MRC framework for the, uh, developing evidence base for complex interventions. And, in, you know, that we had a lot of kind of background data that sort of suggested potential benefits and kind of clinical promise and so on. And we had some sort of basic feasibility data, but it was at a point where there hadn't been sort of larger trials. And so it was kind of, I think, ideally placed for this, this sort of next step of a feasibility RCT. Um, I think having the pilot data ready from that trainee project really helped. Um, I think, you know, PPI was really important. We managed to get some money from the RDS to support PPI meetings. Luckily, we'd already done a bit of kind of PPI um, in the past as well with young people. So we had... Um, we had a kind of a, you know, a few meetings that happened there. And I think one key thing um, that I get the sense that can be helpful is being able to be quite explicit in how PPI shaped the application. So in this case, you know, it helped in terms of the sort of, for example, the choice of measures and picking out certain kind of measures. There's a, I think one of the measures we're looking at is something on academic stress, which is an idea that came out of those discussions, for example. So I think being able to kind of have those examples of how PPI is actually shaped the application can be quite useful. Um, we had a really good team, which is helpful. Um, yeah, we had really good links of organisations. So we managed to kind of get Universities UK um, were happy to kind of give us a supporting letter and some other kind of third sector groups and so on were really on board with the application, which was great. I think the topic area as well is just topical about student mental health. And I think, you know, obviously suicide in young people is always going to be seen as a important issue but I think that you know in terms of kind of the topic I think that was kind of helped to the funding but I think also just look as I said I think there is an element of that of any application um you know sort of chance to it as well um but yeah if you go on to the last slide I think this is it now I mean I've already kind of touched on this so I'll leave it there and not use up too much time but yeah just to reiterate the things that were already helpful PPI being really important having pilot studies and data already there for the kind of to support the application, I think really helped. Um, yeah, and I think having a break between applications is a good idea. Um, good, I'll leave it there.